which are found very nicely and very bioavailably in meat. Uh, there was a nice study out of Stanford University in 2018 looking at major depressive disorder. And one of the major associations we saw was a relative deficiency in uh, carnitine. And carnitine is something that is found to be low in people that are on either plant-based diet or low meat diets. Mm -hmm. And that's highly associated with, with depression. Now, uh, where do you get carnitine? Well, you get it from red meat. That's where you can get it. You can certainly raise your levels. And so, uh, so the short answer is I, I do think it can positively help those things. What do you want to call it? Cure or not? Uh, that's, you know, that's a, that, that's, that's a semantic thing. All I care about is people feel better and they don't have to take drugs anymore. I think that's a great, that's a great thing. Um, Hello my darlings and welcome back to my channel. I am back with yet another carnivore video. This is part two of my third chat with the very esteemed Dr. Shauna Baker. Um, I'm not going to do too much of an intro because he doesn't even need one, but we're going to be talking a lot of things about the carnivore diet. So if you guys have chronic problems, you're chronically overweight, you have chronic stomach problems like I did, um, then you have to watch this video. It will really help you and just help to kind of push you in the right direction. Now, keep in mind that, yes, I am a huge fan of the carnivore diet, but it's not gonna work for everyone. So just putting that out there, um, just be sure to hit the bell button and give me a big thumbs up and let's get straight into this video. I hope you guys enjoy. Um, how do you meet all of your nutritional needs on a carnivore diet? <laughs> Eat enough. <laughs> you know, okay. I know that's I know it's a silly flipping answer, but I mean that, that's, that's honestly the truth. I think uh, um, you know if we look at the RDA, you know the recommended daily allowances or DRIs, dietary reference indices, they were determined based on a kind of an omnivorous standard. 60% carbohydrate, you know, most, much of that is grain, uh, you know, diet. And so this is what we, we were sort of basing, assuming everyone falls roughly within that area. And if you, if you don't hit enough vitamin C or vitamin D or vitamin A or manganese or whatever, you're going to end up with some sort of nutrient deficiency or subclinical deficiency. And that's probably fair and true for those people that continue to eat them that, 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 uh, uh, style, but when you start to dramatically alter your entire nutritional scheme, I think there's pretty strong evidence to indicate that some of those nutritional crime requirements change. And you know, the one answer is, you know, if if that wasn't the case, then I would have died long ago. Though, something like scurvy. Mm -hmm. The fact that it hasn't happened, the fact that I'm still alive and kicking, and I would argue thriving, kind of points away from that. And, you know, we can look into some of the mechanistic data and why that may be true. I mean, you know, I'll use an example of zinc, you know, it's, you know, there's plenty of zinc in meat, but for those people that are eating, say a mixed diet, and it includes a lot of phytic acid, and we find phytic acid in things like grains and legumes and beans. And if you eat a lot of that in your diet, then your zinc doesn't get absorbed very well. And so uh, if the, um, you know, and I can't remember what the actual number on the zinc requirement is, but I know if you eat, a thousand milligrams of phytic acid, so one gram of phytic acid, then your zinc requirement now has doubled. And if you eat 2000 milligrams or two grams of phytic acid, now your zinc requirements have tripled. And so we see that, you know, even within the RDA. And so I think that that's probably relevant for most nutrients. And so one of the things we know, vitamin C is the one I always likes to talk about. And, and again, we don't know for sure, but we know that, you know, like for instance, vitamin C is an antioxidant. Well, when we're on a low carb diet and when we're on a meat-based diet, our other antioxidants actually ramp up in, in production. So we have higher levels of uh, you know, our, our, our naturally produced antioxidants, one of which is uric acid, by the way. Uric acid is actually uh, an antioxidant rather than just something that gives us gout or associated with gout. And so we see elevations in some of these other things. Uh, we see uh, uh, also with regard to Vitamin C is very crucial for carnitine function. So carnitine is something that's involved in ox fat oxidation and shuttling, uh, you know, fats into the into the cell or into the into the mitochondria. And um, vitamin C is involved in its production. But however, when we're eating a meat-based diet, we're actually consuming a lot of carnitine, and there are actual 
gut transporter specifically for carnitine. So we're kind of obviating some of the, some of the needs of vitamin C. Uh, we know that, uh, for instance, glucose is known to compete with vitamin C through across several membrane transporters. So in and out of the mitochondria, across the gut membrane, so if a lot of the glucose is around, vitamin C has a harder time getting through. And so when you don't have a lot of glucose around, vitamin C can travel more freely. The red blood cell can re actually recycle vitamin C. Yeah. And so when it's, when it's needed, you know, it, can, it can do that. So there's a lot of just sort of compensatory mechanisms to why we don't see that, you know, and even when, I mean, to further this point, you know, there's a nice study looking at some of the Inuit from, you know, this is an older study from the 1920s or 30s, and they were looking at vitamin D consumption, because one of the things we know, most of us know by now, vitamin D is associated with sunlight. Well, some of these northern populations that were living, you know, with very little sunlight would often have very low vitamin D levels. And so the concern is, well, why aren't they developing signs of vitamin D deficiency, specifically something called rickets, which is kind yeah. of an abnormality of the bone. Uh, it sure shows up uh, in kids uh, for sure. And they found that there were, they looked at two groups of, of, of Inuit and both of them had very low levels of vitamin D in their blood, but one of them showed up with rickets and one did not. And so the question was, why does one group get rickets at this low level of vitamin D and why does one not? And what it turned out is the group that was getting rickets in addition to their traditional diet of, you know, seafood, you know, meat, you know, and, and fat and blubber and caribou, the ones that got rickets were also eating flour and sugar and canned goods. And so what happens is even with the exact same level of vitamin D, adding all those other foods in there caused, cause additional um, nutritional problems. So again, I, I just, I just, I think it's more complicated than just saying it's a one size fit all requirement for, for every single person which you know, I think most people could, would, would understand. That's probably even intuitively obvious. Yeah, I see what you mean. There are people that say that you have to eat, for example, liver, and you have to eat a nose to tail carnivore meats. Now, I don't think you agree with that, right? Why I, don't not? Agree. I don't agree with the necessity of doing that. I don't mm. disagree that it's good to do and fine to do. And there's, some, there's certainly some good reason to do it, but to sit there and say that you have to do that or somehow you'll get sick uh, is just not borne out by clinical experience. I mean, we've got too many people that have been thriving just eating ground beef and nothing else. And so um, I think one of the things is, you know, the, the arguments that they make for this are sometimes very, I think very easy to poke holes in. You know, one is they'll say, well, look at our ancestors, look at these indigenous tribes they will go out of their way to eat, you know, you know, whatever, brain or liver or kidney. And, you know, what I would say is most of the modern indigenous tribes that we've been able to observe in the last hundred years or so are people that are really kind of in a subsistence situation. They are, they're scraping by. You can look at probably some of the remaining aboriginal folks in, in Australia. They're kind of, they're, they're not on the prime land. I mean, they're, they're kind of stuck in the worst of the worst places in many cases, you know, they're yeah. stuck on reservations. We saw the same with Native Americans, but you see it all throughout the world. And so their prime hunting grounds have gotten to where it's hard for them to actually acquire much food. And so they're not going to waste a single calorie. Now, do you contra even in the animal kingdom, you'll see the same thing. If an animal has access to unlimited food, they often will not eat everything. They will, they will pick the part they like and leave the part alone. And, and that's the difference between surplus hunting and, and subsistence hunting. And I would argue, and I think there's pretty good evidence to do this, that, that early on in our human existence, once we got proficient at hunting, some people would point to Homo erectus, you know, a million and a half years ago. Once they got good at killing elephants, it was like every day was a buffet. And so you had all the food you could actually want. And it wasn't, it wasn't a challenge to get that. And so uh, the other thing is, you know, the, the argument is, well, look at look at a wolf, you know, or a, or a lion. They'll, the first thing they do is they'll rip into the viscera, you know, they'll eat the belly or something like that. And while that's often true, uh, one of the reasons I think beyond for that is most of the animals that wolves will hunt or lions will hunt are going to be fairly lean animals. You know, they're not, they're not hunting big fat hippopotamuses and elephants very rarely. I mean, like every once in a while, a lion might catch a a baby elephant, but that's a rarity. Usually they're eating gazelles and zebras and things like that. These are very lean, high protein, low fat animals. And so they, they do need to get some fat in there. So what they do is they go for the organs and that's the only place they can access fat. So I think it's really uh, a fat um, seeking behavior and, and humans, 
-hmm. humans in particular are very much uh, have a higher fat requirement than some of these other carnivorous animals. I mean, we, because of the size of our brain, require so much relative en energy that we have to have access to fat. And that's one of the reasons we, um, you know, started eating the brains of animals and their, their, uh, their bone marrow and so on and so forth. And I think, and, and that's why we preferentially chose the fattier animals. If you, you know, talk to any of these old hunting tribes, in America, you know, the, the Native Americans in particular were known for picking out the fattest buffalo or bison in the in the herd and that's what they went for and if they killed a lean one they would just almost walk away from it because they realized the value of getting fat in their protein there's no problem getting it plenty of protein on an animal based diet you can get it all day but i think it's really uh, the fat seeking behavior is why we kind of went after viscera and those types of things and so um well i don't think there's anything wrong with eating organ meats i mean you know there's some people who say you could overdose on vitamin a and liver and stuff like that i don't really see that happening very much at all i mean it's theoretically possible and you might if you go overboard you might get into an issue with that but but i think that uh um unfortunately there's some people that sort of have a, a conflict of interest and that they're maybe they're selling liver supplements or organ meat supplements and telling you, you must eat it or you're going to get sick and and oh yeah by the way they taste disgusting so therefore buy my handy dandy overpriced supplement to, to, to make sure you get your, your needs met. And I think that's unfortunately a little, uh, I think it's a little bit disingenuous and, and unethical in my view to some degree. But again, if there are, there's clearly evidence of people eating them and clearly there's cultures that, that, that clearly prize them and, and, uh, and enjoy them. But, but just as equally there are places, you know, that, you know, got rid of that stuff and they would give it to the poor people they were like you know when i ate this stuff it's mm. you know you have to give it to feed it to the dogs i mean stefanson who was the famous uh polar explorer who spent you know 12 years living among the Inuit, would, would basically kick flat out said look i think the perfect diet is meat plus fat and organ meats or something and there's an interview there's a nice interview from i think the early 1960s where he literally sits there on camera and says look organ meats we threw away to the dogs you don't need to eat them uh, you know they're, they're clearly not required and i that's just what I've seen clinically. I mean, I've got data to show that Harvard University is about to, to release a study on this. And, and I, I was able to talk to the, the investigators about this. And they said, look, the people that were eating organ meats fared no better than the people that weren't. There were no increased uh, nutritional deficiencies. There were no increased uh, changes in, in health outcomes. And so it's so I think if you like them, eat them. If, they, if you feel like they're giving you a benefit, eat them. But if somebody tells you you have to eat them, mm -hmm. I would say that's probably not true. Okay. Interesting. All right. Um, let's talk about the gut microbiome. How does it change on a carnivore diet? Uh, well, I mean, again, this is not something we have just a tremendous amount of data on. I've seen, you know, a number of people going on a carnivore diet. And what I will say is we don't seem to see any significant loss of gut diversity. The, the, the diversity seems to be very high. I've gotten, there's, in fact, there's a fellow Australian by the name of Adam Viscovich, who I interviewed a couple of years ago for, he had issues with ulcerative colitis, uh, which is an autoimmune uh, inflammatory bowel disorder, which can be very, very uh, devastating to people. And he basically essentially effectively put it into remission or some might call it cured his, his disease through a carnivore diet. And he had had serial microbiome tests. You know, I think he had you know, five or six of those over the years and the best quote unquote, the best result. And it's debatable what the best result is, but some people will say, you know, certain ratios of different organisms and certain uh, uh, levels of diversity. He had the best result he'd ever had going from like the six percentile of diversity up to the 97th percentile of diversity by going on a carnivore diet. So um, it, it clearly affects it. Everything we eat is going to have an impact on that, but I don't think it causes a negative effect. There's, again, back to the Inuit, there were studies looking at Inuit gut biomes, and they showed widely divide, diverse gut biomes. So it, it, it's not, you know, I think the the sort of critiques around carnivore diet based on gut bite don't, don't really bear out again in, in actual clinical practice. Okay, interesting. Um, can a carnivore diet cure depression, anxiety, and all those kinds of things that affect the brain? Well, I think nutrition clearly has a uh, impact on on mental health, mood disorders. I mean, it, it's 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 absolutely clear. I mean, there's I, I think most people recognize there's a gut brain axis, and so 
what impacts our gut? Well, largely what we eat. And so clearly there's a relationship there. I can tell you um, without, without a doubt, I had the fortune to meet and talk to literally hundreds and hundreds of people who have come off medications for depression, anxiety, bipolar disorder, uh, dramatic improvements of PTSD, ADHD, even autism. Uh, have, have, have seen improvements. Now, whether you want to call it a cure or whatever is, is you know, it's kind of a semantics thing, but clearly it impacts it. It seems to impact it in a very strongly positive way for most people. Uh, why that's occurring, I think, you know, we see a decrease in gut inflammation, gut permeability, which can be associated with increased in permeability and inflammation around in the blood brain barrier. Uh, we see uh, better nutrition. We see better nutritional uptake. We see some of the compounds in meat have been shown to have very positive effects on the brain, things like creatine, carnosine, uh, carnosine, uh, you know, things like, you know, even just zinc and iron. Um, I think that, uh, you know, does it happen for every single person? Probably not. Are there other factors that go into that? Absolutely. But I think, you know, if we're looking to maximize our outcomes and we should include diet in addition to whatever else, whether it's cognitive behavioral therapy or even in the case of medications, diet should be a, a very primary, um, you know, tool that we use. And it's a, it's a shame to me that when we see, like I see these rehab rehab centers where people are dealing with drug addiction or alcohol addiction or or even tra trauma, you know, where they've got these traumatic incidents, and I mean they're literally in there just eating junk food all day long. You know, I just don't, I think that just facilitates their, 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 their you know, negative brain uh, pathophysiology that's going on. So I think that's something, and you know, guys like Christopher Palmer at Harvard, he's doing a lot of research on this and he's clearly seeing effects on, say for instance, ketogenic diets and things like schizophrenia and depression and on and on. So the short answer is, yes, I think it helps. And, I, and I've seen it help many times. Well, definitely for me, it's, it's helped hugely um when i spoke to you last time i decided to try the carnival diet again so now is my sixth week on the diet and it's gotten to the point where i can't actually eat anything but pretty much red meat like i had yogurt the other day and i felt sick for three days three days so i don't know i suppose a really good journey to see what my body can handle and what it can't so yeah um all right so people can find you online you've got your website you've got your instagram and where else yeah so uh my you know meetrx.com i'm there every single day at nine o'clock you know it's not convenient for australia unfortunately we do get a few australians in there i think it's like three o'clock in the morning for them but i I do that. We have meetings all the time. So if you wanted to speak with me directly, that's a great way to do it. I am on Instagram, Sean Baker, 1967. So S-H-A-W-N-B-A-K-E-R, 1967. I'm on YouTube. I've got a YouTube channel, Sean Baker. Uh, Twitter, if it comes back up or not, I'm <laughs> sure we'll see. So that was S Baker MD. We'll see if that, that gets back, but reinstated. I'm, I'm kind of 50-50 uh, on that. Uh, and then um, I started on TikTok just for I'm not even oh, sure. You I, did, eh? <laughs> yeah, that's Sean, Sean Baker, MD on TikTok. And so, okay. uh, you know, I'm, I'm still trying to navigate this stuff and, and just trying to get the message out there. But, uh, but yeah, that's, that's uh, where you go. I, I do some, a little bit of consulting with people. I, I still, I, I take care of a lot of like uh, high level athletes and, but, but really anybody that wants to help them. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to chat with you and provide that. But uh, yep, that's, uh, that's where you can find me. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks so much. Perfect. Thank you so much, Stina. Let me know how things go and talk to you again down the road, maybe. Okay. Yeah. See ya. Bye. Bye now.